Fishman Rothman, 97.1 The Fan. NFL Draft starts tonight, first round. With that, we bring on a guy who knows a lot about a lot of the guys who are going to be picked tonight, knows a lot about this senior class, and knows what it's like to be in an NFL war room uh, very well. Phil Savage, Executive Director of the Senior Bowl, analyst for the Crimson Tide Radio Network. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time. And you've been in this seat before that Michael Lombardi's in, literally in this seat, in fact. What is going through his mind? What was going through your mind at this point in these late hours leading up to the draft? Well, really, this is the calm before the storm in terms of buttoning down the final uh, information pieces in terms of telephone numbers, fielding a few phone calls from other teams, getting a lay of the land. But I think the most important thing as a first-year GM is to make sure that you get it right. And I think for the Browns at number six, they have to be very hopeful that one of those offensive tackles most likely Lane Johnson would still be on the board at number six because if that's the case, they likely will be able to move out of that sixth spot. Now, if the three tackles go in the top five, I think that they'll be looking at Barkevius Mingo, the outside backer from LSU, or D. Milner from Alabama. To me, those would be the two players that would help them the most defensively as they make this transition back to the 3-4. Phil, yeah, that's a definite need, and I. this is the weird thing for Browns fans right now, I think, in, in everyone's mind, is that this is a quarterback-driven NFL, and we automatic, automatically assume that a lot of these guys coming out could be great quarterbacks in the NFL. Some could be just average. You faced it with Quinn. You've, you've, you've been through this. There are a lot of mock drafts that say that Geno Smith will be there, and the Browns should take him. Where do you stand on that? Because Bo and I both believe – that you've been through this gauntlet of Fry and Anderson, Quinn and DeLome and McCoy and Whedon, and we don't – and do you have to look at the past and and say, hey, we cannot get ourselves into this? Or how do you think they're going to deal with that, with Geno if he's available at six? Well, I think they have to do what they think is best for them. And, you know, last year Brandon Whedon was taken in the first round. Uh, one scenario and one situation that's been brought up as recently as this morning – is Ryan Mallett, the quarterback at the New England Patriots. There might be a feeling that if the Browns can get out of that sixth pick and pick up a, an extra choice or two in the second or third round, that maybe they could make a trade for Ryan Mallett and stay out, out of the rookie quarterback situation altogether. In other words, they'd have Whedon coming back with a year of experience under his belt, and then Ryan Mallett with the Bill Belichick and Patriots pedigree, even though he hadn't played a lot, uh, people think that he might have the, the potential to be a starter, and then you'd have those two uh, have a competition probably going into 2013. Talking to Phil Savage, former Browns GM and executive director of the Senior Bowl and an analyst on the Crimson Tide Radio Network. And, and Phil, that last part is kind of where I want to go next because uh, when you talk about being on that Crimson Tide Radio Network and I look at any first-round mock draft, they are loaded with SEC guys, obviously, and Bama's, I think, got four guys projected in the first round again, and that's been kind of a tradition there. Um, as you look at this this class of SEC guys coming into the league, which of these guys do you really love? Who do you think has Difference Maker written all over them? And I know that there might be more than one, so if there's a couple that you really love, go ahead. Well, I think from an Alabama standpoint, the most secure pick that anyone could make is going to be Chance Warmack, the offensive guard. Now, that's not a sexy choice, and, and, you know, he's not a left tackle, but he will be a plug-in and play starter with the potential to be a pro bowler uh, very soon. Now, D. Milner, he's got the height, the weight, the speed. He's got the athleticism. He made a lot of plays for Alabama this year. Uh, in my opinion, he may not be in the class of a Charles Woodson or Champ Bailey or even a Chris McAllister, but in this particular draft, He's warranting a first a 10 pick consideration. If the Browns took him at six, I don't think that would be a mistake at all. And then a couple of other players, DJ Fluker is going to be a starter at right tackle uh, his first year. Most likely should go somewhere in the teens, maybe as early as 11 or 12 to San Diego and Miami. And then the fourth potential first rounder for Bama will be Eddie Lacy, the running back. I, I think the question on him is, do you really believe he can be the lead ball carrier, the bell cow, or do you think he's just the lead ball carrier as part of a committee? And I think most teams probably look at him as more of a committee-type guy. Therefore, I, I, I'm not convinced that he's going to go in the first round. 
Phil, uh, let me take you back to the quarterbacks. It seems like it's uh, if Cleveland likes Geno, let's say let's say Cleveland right now has on their board Geno and then Nassib. Um, and who knows, maybe, maybe Barkley, maybe somebody might trade up to get him in the first. Who knows, maybe that's a safe thing. Um, like the Eagles or somebody could take, maybe E.J. Manuel gets in there. But taking a guy that high, it doesn't cost you the same, right? With the new CBA, like it won't cost you this 35 or $45 million guaranteed. Does that change the equation for some of these teams wanting to maybe take a flyer on a guy who's not considered a franchise quarterback? I think it does if you don't have a quarterback at all. But I think the issue for the Browns right now is if you take Geno Smith at number six, then you're, the fans, the media, the public is going to want to see Geno Smith. So they would, in, in my view, they basically would cut the cord with Brandon Whedon and move him out as soon as this weekend. Because if they're going to take a quarterback in the top ten, then he's going to play this year sooner rather than later. And that's the issue that the, that the Browns and the quandary they're in right now, is if they're not totally in love with Geno, then they might try to hedge their bets in some other ways by making a trade or maybe if they can move back, pick up a second-round pick and maybe take a flyer on a Mike Glennon or an E.J. Manuel or a guy like that that potentially could still be there uh, in the second round. Talking to Phil Savage, executive director of the Senior Bowl and an analyst on the Crimson Tide Radio Network. Um, I, I guess for me, and, and obviously you're a GM, you've been a GM, you know this exactly, but for me I just think like if a guy can play, he can play. And, and I know that we get we fall in love and I with some of these measurable stuffs around this time of year, but I'm looking at some mock drafts that has Alec Ogletree dropping to 32. I'm looking at a mock draft that has, for example, Jarvis Jones, who I thought was maybe the one of the best defensive players in the country, dropping to 17. Uh, there's another one that, I mean, Mingo at 13. Am I nuts? or do, I mean, I think all three of those guys are plug them in play starters from day one, and I see draft, mock drafts that have Manti Teo going ahead of Alec Ogletree. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around. I watch him play, and it looks like apples and oranges to me. You've seen these guys up close in the SEC. Am I misreading their talent? Well, I think with Ogletree, it's probably more off-field concerns, certainly not athletic concerns. He may be the most talented linebacker in the entire draft uh, when you take it all into consideration. With Barkevius Mingo, he played defensive end at LSU, and he didn't post great production numbers, but he's got all the skills that you would want in a projection to outside linebacker. And that's why you see him uh, in that top 15 range. In some ways, he's a lot like Cameron Wembley, who was a defensive end at Florida State that we converted to 3-4 outside backer. Uh, Barkevius kind of fits in that category. And as far as Jarvis Jones is concerned, you know, he's a player that you would see flash when you flipped on the television on Saturday afternoon or Saturday night. But when you really study the tape, and I learned this from a scout that worked with Bill Parcells at one point, he said these pass rushers have to have an escape move, a second counter move. And Jarvis Jones' main move is to punch with his hands, slip the blocker, get off, and go rush the quarterback. Now, he ran 4-9 plus in his pro day. He didn't test extremely well, and I think teams have struggled to say, do we really buy into the fact that this guy's going to be able to go generate the kind of numbers that he had in college? He's not Terrell Suggs. Terrell Suggs was in the 265-pound range, was faster off of the edge, and I just worry a little bit, and I think other people are concerned that Jarvis may not have that second move uh, to, to beat these Long limb, six foot seven, three hundred twenty pound offensive tackle. Phil, you were obviously in a position where the Browns were, where you felt like there was a a playoff window, a championship window that was that was open at the time, and you guys may have dealt with that differently than maybe this new regime with the Browns. And I'm curious what your feeling is there. That do they? Feel, I know the pressure's on them. There's no doubt. When you pick six, the pressure's on, on you to make something happen. But do you feel like that they, that they have a little bit of a cushion here? as far as if they go the safer route, take the defensive guy that fits the scheme, take the offensive lineman that you mentioned, that sort of thing? Or do you think it's more of, hey, it's win now, this is the way it is, you can't give away seasons? How do you feel they'll deal with the pressure tonight looking forward big picture? Well, I think with with the Browns, they're they're under new ownership. They've got a new coach, a new general manager and president, uh, essentially for, for 2013. 
And uh, I think they have some leeway here. Uh, the window has gotten shorter and shorter, though, in terms of the patience with the fans and the media. And, you know, anytime you go in and you're part of the new regime, and it's a mistake I made, you know, you feel like you've got three or four, maybe even five years to put a plan together. Well, those those days are gone. Now you almost have to have about a year-and-a-half, two-year plan. People are going to want to see progress. Uh, before rather than after. And I think for the Browns, they have to believe that going into next year with Brandon Whedon and maybe somebody else to compete, along with a draft pick at 6 or 11 or 12 or wherever they choose in terms of a defensive player, and then circle back and try to fill in the blanks in the, in the defensive secondary, that probably would give them the best chance uh, to win more games this year. To throw a rookie quarterback out there, new coach, New GM, new president, new owner. That's a tall order to say that you're going to go win uh, more than two or three games. Phil Savage, uh, the guest of the program right now. Uh, I'll get you out of here on this one. We we obviously the Browns took Trent Richardson number one or you know first round pick a year ago. We saw flashes of from him, but you really didn't have that huge year that I think a lot of people were hoping that he would have. Now some of that has to do is that they couldn't really stretch the field till Josh Gordon came along came along later in the year. You saw Trent up close and personal. What type of, of career do you kind of health considering he stays healthy, what type of career do you think he can have? What type of player did the Browns get with Trent Richardson? Well I think that's the the point that I would make is that last year I'm not sure that Trent ever really had a chance to get 100% healthy, and he certainly didn't have much time to recover because this draft process is grueling on these college players. Now that he's gotten a year under his belt, he's had the off season to get himself fully remedied. I mean, you're talking about a great football player. I mean, Trent is a, a fantastic player. He's tough. He understands the game. He wants to be a good player, and uh, he's secure with the football. He can catch and block and I think as the Browns evolve and develop their offense, you're going to see the ball go through his hands. And Chud is great. Uh, Rob Chudzinski, the head coach, he's terrific in terms of making sure the ball gets funneled to his best players. And so Trent's going to get that opportunity this year. And I, I don't think Browns fans are going to be disappointed in 2013 or 2017. I think he's going to be a mainstay for Cleveland. Bill Savage, thanks for the time, man. We appreciate it. Okay, guys. Y'all have a great night. I appreciate it.